This is an ODB Films production. Visit odbfilms.com today. In Latin, renovo means to renew, restore, or revive. This show is all about growing in our understanding and practice of faith. Past episodes are available wherever you like to listen to podcasts. I'm Doug Tuke, the Vice President of Ministry Advancement at ODB Films. And today, we talk about the Illuminati. That's right, all you Dan Brown readers, eat your hearts out. We get to the guts of this super secret society working post-enlightenment to deconstruct all things church. Okay, here's the thing. Dan Brown, author of Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons, most recently Origin. He would love us all to believe in this massive tension between religion and science, and there is, uh, which is stupid. And we've actually talked about that. We've done a lot of shows on that. But here's the deal. A lot of this tension is born out of his kind of fictionalizing of an organization called the Illuminati. And so this is why I thought it'd be cool to talk about it. Now, we just recently did a show on the Masons and Illuminati and the Masons have a lot of similarities, but they are different. They are very different. So I really just want to dig into the guts of what this thing is and why it matters to sort of the modern Catholic faith. Also, to stimulate a conversation about free thinking and the Enlightenment. In fact, I think I'm going to do a show on the Catholic Church and the Enlightenment because it seems like that's the roots of a lot of stupid tension. So we're just going to get on it. So. When it comes to shadowy groups that supposedly control the world, the Illuminati should be at the top of any conspiracy theorist list. It's got conspiracy theory written all over. It's just insane. There's like an Illuminati Facebook page. It has 3.4 million likes. Madonna writes songs about it and like YouTube channels calling pretty much everyone Illuminati. They notch almost 200,000 subscribers. So to sort out the truth about the Illuminati, I did a bunch of reading. I did a bunch of research. I consulted a bunch of different experts on the subject. Mark A. Fenster is a law professor at the University of Florida, and he's an author of a book called Conspiracy Theories, Secrecy and Power in American Culture. And he pretty much sums up why Illuminati, this group, has such a longstanding appeal. He says, it's absurd on its face that you've got this sacred group that's more than 300 years old and continue to see arguments about its relevance today. And then he says, the fact that the discussion is alive is amazing which I agree. Thank you, Dan Brown, for keeping it alive. So the Illuminati, it wasn't always just some crazy fantasy. In fact, it actually used to be a very real group with super ambitious goals. And even though it doesn't exist anymore, the fact that a lot of people still have these kind of paranoid beliefs about it, it actually reveals a lot about kind of the power of what the group was and its influence on culture. And of course, it affects what we think about Jay-Z. We'll talk more about that later. Okay. So what is the Illuminati? So it's a, in the historical sense, the term Illuminati actually refers to the Bavarian Illuminati, which was a secret society that operated for only a decade from 1776 to 1785. And the organization was founded by Adam Weishaupt, a German law professor who believes strongly in enlightenment ideals. So thinking beyond current social constructs and his Illuminatordnen sought to promote those ideals among elites. OK, so his group of illuminated wanted to promote that idea. So Weishaupt wanted to educate Illuminati members in reason, philanthropy, and other kind of secular values that they could influence political decisions when they came to power. Uh, Chris Hodap and Alice Von Cannon, they co-wrote a book called Conspiracy Theories and Secret Societies for Dummies, which was actually pretty funny to get through. And they said this, it was pretty ambitious for six or nine guys But they really wanted to take over the world. And they really did. They wanted to completely change thinking of the time. So the Illuminati's goals and reputation often uh, really exceeded their means. Uh, uh, Chris Hodap, that author, he says uh, in its early days, the group was just a handful of people. And even at its largest, it actually only consisted of somewhere between 650 and 2,500 members. So the group grew to that size by becoming a sort of like sleeper cell within other groups. So Illuminati members joined Freemason lodges to recruit members for their own uh, competing kind of secret society. Okay, what did they believe? Here's the deal. There were two sides to the historical Illuminati. So their odd rituals and their ideals. Okay, so the Illuminati did plenty of unusual things. They used symbols like the owl. Um, They adopted pseudonyms to avoid identification. And they had these kind of complicated hierarchies like novice Minervil and illuminated Minervil that divided the ranks. So in the beginning, 
Hodep says in his book, he says, Illuminati members didn't trust anyone over 30 because they were too set in their ways. Uh, And then other reports of rituals are kind of harder to confirm. They're all over the board. But we know that members were very paranoid and used these kind of spy-like protocols to keep one another's identities a secret. How about that? But while they were following these sort of bizarre rituals, they also promoted a worldview that reflected the Enlightenment ideals like rational thought and self-rule. So a very like anti-clerical, anti-royal the Illuminati were were closer to revolutionaries than really world rulers, since they, they they really sought to infiltrate and upset powerful institutions like the monarchy and the Catholic Church. At the time, you got to remember, 18th century, the Catholic Church had massive social influence uh, politically as well. So they wanted to get in there and pull it apart, rip it up. So did the Illuminati manage to control the world? Here's the deal. Historians tend to think that the Illuminati were only mildly successful at best and becoming even remotely influential. So, of course, there are also those who believe that the Illuminati successfully took over the world, and they still control it today, and it's so secret that no one knows it. Wow, go make a movie. Um, if if an all-powerful group does dominate the world, we probably wouldn't know about it. We'll just, we'll just go with that in all conspiracy theories. But it's also difficult to kind of untangle the success of the Illuminati from that of the Freemasons, because there was so much infiltration going on. So, um, they commingled so much that no one really knows what a lot of those boundaries are. It's just as tough to tell what influence the Illuminati actually had as opposed to the influence people think they had. The, the mythology is really kind of placated. So we do know the Illuminati had some influential members along with many dukes and other leaders who were powerful but are kind of forgotten today. Some sources think that um, the writer Johann Goe uh, was a member of the group. Though other sources dispute that claim. And in a way, Illuminati influence depends on what you believe about them. So if you think their revolutionary ideals spread to other groups like the French Revolution, uh, Jacobins, uh, the author, uh, says that in his book, then they were totally successful. But if you think those ideas would have prospered regardless, then they were mainly a historical curiosity and and really nothing more. So why did the real Illuminati disappear? What's the deal? Um, Hodap says in his book. Uh, that they were wiped out. So he says people have tried to revive them over the years, but it's really just a money-making scheme. So in 1785, Duke of Bavaria, Carl Theodore, banned secret societies, including the Illuminati, and then instituted serious punishments for anyone who joined them. So most of the group's secrets were disclosed or published. And if you believe the most historians, the Illuminati, just they just disappeared. So From the moment of the disbanding, however, that's when the myth got bigger. This is where Dan Brown gets excited and found some good ethos, even though it's fake, for his books. So this is described in the book I told you about, Conspiracy Theories in American History, an encyclopedia. This It documents uh, kind of found in the homes of high-ranking Illuminati members like Xavier von Zwack. Uh, They confirmed some of the spookiest kind of Illuminati theories like their dreams of world domination and this kind of cultish behavior. Even though those documents may exaggerate the truth about the group, there has been uh, journals found about them and whatnot. So if the Illuminati vanished, how did their legend live on? Okay, here's the deal. Almost immediately after the Illuminati were disbanded, conspiracy theories about the group totally sprang up. So the most famous conspiracy theories were authored by physicist John Robison in 1797, who accused the Illuminati of infiltrating the Freemasons and uh, Abbey Augustin Barul, whose 1797 history of the Jacobins promoted the theory that secret societies, including the Illuminati, were behind the French Revolution. That's where that rumor comes from. Now, historians tend to see these as the first in a long line of conspiracy theories, though, again, for those who believe that the Illuminati run the world today, this is arguably proof of the group's power. I know that's kind of weird. Now, later on, some of the founding fathers managed to stoke interest in the Illuminati in the United States. In 1798, George Washington wrote a letter addressing the Illuminati threat. He believed it had been avoided, but his mentioning it helped bolster the myth. So in the panic caused by the anti-Illuminati books and sermons, Thomas Jefferson was baselessly accused of being a member of the group. It was a way to kind of throw dirt on him in American politics. So all these kind of early Illuminati panics fizzled out. They gave the group just kind of like a semblance, just like a seed of legitimacy that later on 
would help make a centuries long conspiracy seem way more plausible. Okay. What's the relationship to the Freemasons? Let's get into this a little bit more. Okay. Conspiracy theories have always been popular in the United States, but listen, here's the thing for centuries. The Illuminati were way less feared than the Freemasons. And we did a show on Freemasons. Check it out. I talked about that earlier, but really honestly, get in there because there's going to be there's going to be more details to it than I can cover here. But here's the deal. The 1828 anti-Masonic party that was real was based on an opposition to the Freemasons. And though the party died out, Freemasons remained a focal point for paranoia in America because the Illuminati recruited lots of members in Europe. Through Freemason lodges, the two groups are almost always confused for each other. So to some degree, Freemason paranoia grew out of the Freemasons' influence in the United States. Lots of founding fathers were members, after all. We talked about that before. And some really key American symbols were derived from the Freemasons. There's a strong argument that the floating eye on the dollar, the eye of providence above a pyramid, actually comes from Freemasonry, right? National treasure, Nicolas Cage. Eat your heart out. Now, there's also an argument that it was meant as a Christian symbol. Uh, The only thing we know for certain is that it has nothing to do with the Bavarian Illuminati. That's just the bottom line. That early Freemason paranoia can help us kind of understand the conspiracy theories about the Illuminati today, though. So Joseph uh, Usinski, uh, who is a political scientist at the University of Miami, co-author of American Conspiracy Theories with Joseph Parent, he says people will use a term like Illuminati to define anything that they don't like that might challenge their values. So it's kind of a big term used to argue against values and virtue in the United States today. You can see the appeal. So why do people still believe in the Illuminati today? So the Illuminati never completely disappeared from pop culture. It was always kind of burbling in the background. But in the mid-70s, 1970s, the Illuminati made a big comeback thanks to a literary trilogy that gave the group the simultaneously spooky and laughable image that it has today. The book is called, or the books are called the Illuminatus trilogy by Robert Shea and Robert Anton Wilson. And they depicted the Illuminati with these uh, kind of ironic detachments. So this trilogy became a countercultural touchstone. And then it kind of just intermingled with real research. So it kind of tried to give itself this like validity Uh, wise and hopped. The founder of the real Illuminati is a character in the books with fantasy and help put the Illuminati back on the radar. So Mark Fenster, um, author, he says it was a great example of the post 60s ways of kind of ironizing elite forms of power. He says that ironic vision of conspiracy theory is extremely widely distributed. You can be both a serious conspiracy theorist and joke about it at the same time. And that this these books really kind of did that for the topic and sold a lot of copies. And from there, the Illuminati became like a periodic staple of both pop culture, as in Dan Brown's massively popular novel, Angels and Demons, and various subcultures where the group is often intermingled with Satanism, alien myths, and other ideas that would have been totally foreign to the actual Bavarian Illuminati. Those types of trends had nothing to do with what the original intention was in sort of a post-enlightenment, secular-thinking philosopher's group, okay? Uskinski, uh, author, uh, he clarifies that most Americans today don't actually believe in the Illuminati. Uh, There was a survey, actually, of conspiracy theories that he conducted in 2012, and he says zero people claim that groups like Freemasons or Illuminati were controlling politics. Even so, the Illuminati seems to kind of persist in our collective consciousness, and it really serves as kind of the butt of jokes And the source of like, you know, like silly, goofy rumors. Um, That's just kind of what it is. Okay, so that one of those rumors that's kind of funny is uh, Jay-Z, Kanye West and other celebrities are in the Illuminati. So Kanye West and Jay-Z spokespersons were actually contacted uh, by an article I read about this and they didn't return the request for comment. But Jay-Z has actually previously said that he thinks rumors of his membership in the Illuminati are stupid. And Kanye West has actually said it's ridiculous. Of course. To conspiracy theorists, that's exactly what a member of the Illuminati would say. Urgh. Okay. Anyway, in a broad sense, rumors about it, about the Illuminati, about celebrities, they really just kind of speak to, to their place and culture. So uh, author Fenster, he sees the kind of half ironic, half serious accusations of Illuminati membership as sort of the latest expression of this old American phenomenon. Uh, he says it marks that Jay-Z and Beyonce seem to live in a different universe than us. He says 
They have secret lives and secret access that seems reptilian. We notice how bizarre their lives seem to be and how powerful they seem to be. We associate them with secrecy or secret power. And that's just kind of dumb, but we do it anyway. And then, and then people validate it by, by supporting that kind of thinking. So Lusinski also notes that the ties between power and conspiracy in the United States are very real. He says, the thing that ties conspiracy theories together is that they always point at someone who is supposedly powerful. He says, you never hear a conspiracy theory about the homeless guy in the street or a gang of poor children. And he's right. So Fenster, Yusinski, a lot of right, these pretty famous writers on this topic, they note that conspiracy theories can in lots of ways represent like real genuine anxieties about social problems. I agree with that. I think, I think it just kind of exploits how we're always looking for greater power in a hidden place, which has obviously deep theological roots. But when we secularize it, it just becomes weird uh, in the kind of a global media driven world. Celebrities really represent for a lot of people something new, an unusual form of power that is kind of some conspiratorial, you know, it needs a response and, and we, and we're drawn to it. And, and that's just, that's just crazy. So here's the deal. I like doing shows about little secret things that people think are destroying the church. And it's amazing to me when you kind of dig in what the, I mean, oh my gosh, like the actual truth behind a lot of these communities is preposterous. It's not some deep, dark secret. It's just not. There's so much out there that's so good. Uh, And secret societies like the Illuminati or even societies that still exist like Freemasons, I think we give them too much credit. And I think the fact that people long for power in that way is, is indicative of not just the times, but of humanity. So dig into it. Uh, you know, you can thank Dan Brown for making it popular again, but here's the deal. It's just a little niche idea. It never really took much traction. I think you can expect us to definitely do a Renovo on Catholicism and the Enlightenment, and we'll dispel some superstition there as well. Thanks for listening. Sincerely. We are partners in the journey of faith. I really hope you'll share the Renovo podcast with friends and foes. Send your topic suggestions, questions, and or comments to Doug at odbfilms.com. Always remember to engage the tradition and live the conversion. Until next time, God bless.